I will call the remote hearing of the Environment and Natural Resources Finance and Policy Committee to order. Today is March 25th, 2022. This meeting is held in accordance with Rule 10.01, which was passed and allows for remote hearings. All remote hearings are recorded and live streamed by House Public Information. The clerk will take attendance by roll. Chair Hansen is present. Vice Chair Wozlowick. Wozlowick present. Lead Heinzman. Lead Heinzman. Representative Akum. Akum present. Representative Ackland. Ackland present. Representative Backer. Backer present. Representative Becker Finn. Becker Finn present. Representative Eklund. Present. Representative Fisher. Fisher present. Representative Green. Present. Representative Igo. Igo present. Representative Jordan. Jordan present. Representative Keeler. Keeler present. Representative Lee is excused. Representative Lippert. My current president. Representative Lewick. Representative Lewick. Uh, Representative Morrison. Morrison present. Representative Nelson. Representative Nelson. Nelson present. Nelson present. Representative Tice. Tice present. Tice present. Thank you. The quorum is present. Representative Lippert, would you like to move the minutes for March 24th? So move, Mr. Chair. Representative Minute Lippert moves the minutes for March 24th, 2022. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. Ayes have it. The minutes are approved. First up, uh, and members, we have a very full agenda today. Um, we reserve the right to maybe change the amount of time within each of the testifiers uh, if we start running late. We have, may, have an ability, may have an ability to go over a little bit, but we also may not. So uh, Representative Dabney, House File 4356, Minnesota Outdoor Recreation Office created. We estimate about half an hour of time for this. I will move that House File 4356 be laid over for possible inclusion in an omnibus bill. Representative Dabney, to your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good morning, members. Uh, when, the, when people around the country think of Minnesota, they think of our natural resources and natural beauty. We are, after all, the land of 10,000 lakes. We're the source of the Mississippi River, the birthplace of water skiing. We've got that quirky Northwest angle uh, that jets up into Canada, and companies such as Polaris, Arctic Cat and now Winnebago Industries are headquartered here. House File 4356 seeks to strengthen that Minnesota brand through the establishment of an Office of Outdoor Recreation tasked with uniting the Minnesota outdoor recreation community, growing access and business opportunity in Minnesota's outdoors, with a particular eye to growth areas, including by historically underrepresented communities in the outdoors as customers, owners, employees, and vendors, all through a collaborative, data-driven process of public-private processes. This is a proven strategy used by 14 other states to build their brand, their economy, their business opportunities in the outdoor recreation space. The pandemic has shown that getting outdoors is good for kids, it's good for adults, and it's good for business. It's time for Minnesota to harness the opportunity of increased use of the outdoors increase access by historically underrepresented communities, convene public and private entities and enthusiasts, steward our natural resources, and build opportunity through an Office of Outdoor Recreation. Mr. Chair, with me are a number of members uh, of the Outdoor Recreation Task Force and others to testify on the bill today. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Dabney. First up, we have Matt Grun, Marine Retailers Association of the Americas. Welcome, Mr. Goon, and state your name. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good morning, members of the committee, and thank you for this opportunity 
uh, to testify. My, my name is Matt Groon. I'm the president of the Marine Retailers Association of the Americas. We are a uh, national trade association representing boat dealers, their customers, uh, the uh, manufacturers and suppliers that they represent uh, across the United States. Our headquarters is here in Minneapolis. We're up in Brooklyn Park. Uh, we've got a little over 40 uh, retail members here in the state. And I also served as a member of the Minnesota Outdoor Rec Task Force, and I'm here today in support of HF uh, 4356. And to really to stress the need that for an Office of Outdoor Recreation here in the state of Minnesota. Uh, I greatly appreciate the, the presentation that was given by the DNR to this committee on uh, Tuesday, February 8th. And I'd like to reiterate and answer one of the questions that was asked that the number one recommendation made by this uh, outdoor rec task force was to create an outdoor rec office uh, to focus on the economic impact that uh, outdoor recreation can have throughout our state. And through the creation of this office, the priorities mentioned uh, by the DNR will be achieved, uh, I believe. Committee members, as you have seen in those recommendations, they clearly outline our state's need for this office, both from a user experience and from an economic impact standpoint. Currently, there are 18 states, including Wisconsin and Michigan, uh, who have offices of outdoor recreation, and their outdoor rec economies and communities are, are seeing an incredible benefit because of it. Uh, for example, Wisconsin grew its outdoor recreation and manufacturing economy by 12% compared to a 7% growth for its overall economy. Um, Michigan's office worked with its uh, Michigan uh, Economic Development Corporation to undertake an analysis of, of the outdoor recreation business in the state and began interviewing businesses and education institutions to map workforce needs in the outdoor industry against education and skill needs to develop more employee training pipelines. And I can tell you that this workforce issue is a major, major issue for all of uh, the outdoor rec industry. And, and one of the last example, you know, Utah coordinated uh, grant funds for the restoration and rehabilitation of existing and developed recreation areas and trails for public access. So while these examples are just kind of a snapshot of, of the potential and the function of an outdoor recreation office, I believe it's clear how this will bolster the state of Minnesota's outdoor rec economy and workforce. And this office could assign a critical accountability for delivering the elements that, that we believe will lead to economic growth in outdoor recreation uh, namely, organizing the industry's outdoor recreation organizations and communities and increasing participation. Uh, this office will further uh, all opportunities in outdoor recreation, whether that's parks, trails, waterways, campgrounds, uh, and the list goes on and on through both motorized and human powered recreation. And in all regions of our great state, urban areas like that represented by uh, Representative Jordan to rural areas like that represented by Representative Eklund. So I am here today to uh, urge you to vote yes for HF 4356 and to help strengthen Minnesota's outdoor recreation economy and expand access to our state's natural resources to everybody. Thank you for your time. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have as well. Thank you. Next up, Jill Sims, National Marine Manufacturers Association. Welcome to the committee and state your name for the record. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Jill Sims with the National Marine Manufacturers Association. I also chair the State Committee for the Outdoor Recreation Roundtable, known as ORR. ORR is made up of 35 outdoor trade associations, and we help promote the growth of the outdoor recreation economy and outdoor recreation activities. Outdoor recreation is a key economic driver in Minnesota. It's no secret Minnesotans love the outdoors, and we are home to some phenomenal outdoor brands and products. Whether you're hunting, fishing, hiking, biking, skiing, boating, paddling, or enjoying whatever outdoor recreation activity you prefer, you're supporting Minnesota, Minnesota's outdoor recreation economy, which generates over $8 billion annually, representing 2.2% of Minnesota's GDP and nearly 100,000 jobs. Throughout the pandemic, we've seen record participation in the outdoor space, and we have no anticipation of slowing down. In response to that, nationally, we've seen states focus on the importance of elevating the outdoor recreation sector by making moves like establishing offices of outdoor recreation. To date, 18 states have established offices or installed directors. These offices have been a lifeline to us, especially throughout the pandemic. Key examples over the last two years include one office helping me reopen boating access to visitors and residents, while another office helped us put together a supply chain summit to connect our manufacturers to the local supply base. 
HF 4356 brings Minnesota in line with the many states who have prioritized outdoor recreation by creating a Minnesota Outdoor Recreation Office. This is an opportunity to help us unify and drive collaboration amongst outdoor recreation stakeholders and help create a better outdoor experience for all Minnesotans and visitors. We're excited the task force recommendations were translated into legislation to bring them to life. In Subdivision 4, we hope there's flexibility for the director to take on new and innovative projects as they arise. We believe this legislation is a really positive step forward to elevate the outdoor recreation community and experience in Minnesota. A big thank you to Representative Dabney for bringing this bill forward. And committee members, we encourage you to support HF 4356. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, Sarah Milligan Toffler, Children and Nature Network. Welcome. And state your name and who you're with for the record. Uh, thank you, Chair Hansen. My name is Sarah Milligan Toffler, and I am the President and CEO of the Children and Nature Network. Um, Children and Nature Network is a national organization that's uh, working to address um, the disconnect from nature that we've seen um, in uh, childhood over the last 40 years. And uh, we're seeing that kids are really missing out on all the benefits that we know regular nature connection can provide, including better health, educational outcomes, and social connections. Um, I too had the um, honor to serve on the Minnesota Outdoor Re Recreation Task Force and really support the testimonies that um, you just heard. Uh, so I won't repeat any of the points that, that my colleagues made, but I want to just share that I, I personally spent more than 40 hours volunteering as part of this task force. And uh, not only was it a rewarding experience, I really learned a lot um, from my colleagues who have really different experiences and think about um, Minnesota's rich outdoor resources in different ways than I do. Um, that said, given the diversity of, you know, uh, human powered motorized um, uh, groups that were represented as part of the, the task force, we had nearly unanimous support for the recommendations that were put forth and uh, are reflected in this um, House File 4356. Um, one of the pieces I guess I would just add to what you've already heard is that the there was unanimous uh, feeling that it was important to have an independent office of recreation um, to really bolster the great work that's being done at the DNR but you know as others have said to be able to serve as that kind of connector of all the various stakeholders across the state and we just heard that that is something that really hasn't been happening and there's just so much opportunity for us to build um, outdoor recreation and engagement by people across the state. So uh, I just will, would end by saying um, we are looking at data coming out of the pandemic. And while some adults actually were spending more time outdoors during the pandemic, we know that across the board, children are spending less time outdoors. So this, um, the timing of this bill couldn't be uh, more important. And you know, on behalf of the Children in Nature Network, I really uh, urge uh, the committee's support of uh, House File 4356 and the creation of an, of an Office of Outdoor Recreation for the state of Minnesota. Um, thank you. Thank you. Next up, Laura Pruce, uh, Minnesota Department of Natural Resources. Good morning, Mr. Welcome. Chair, members. My name is Laura Price. I'm a section manager with the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources um, Division of Parks and Trails. Thanks for the chance to be here today. I'll share some brief perspectives from DNR on this bill. As we all know, outdoor recreation is a huge asset to Minnesota's health, well-being, and economy, as we've heard this morning. Outdoor recreation generates more than $16 billion in consumer spending in our state, and Minnesotans see the outdoors as a place to rejuvenate, spend time with friends and family, and improve their health. 80% of Minnesotans uh, participate in outdoor activities at least once a week. The recently com uh, completed Outdoor Recreation Task Force <clears throat> recommendations emphasize the dramatic importance as well as needs around outdoor recreation in our state. And I'd like to emphasize that the DNR uh, shares those same interests in the importance of outdoor recreation, and it's indeed a major part of our mission. DNR is focused on how to bring measured growth, increased and equitable access, and a higher quality of outdoor recreation opportunities for everyone. And we want to coordinate and collaborate on this work. The Outdoor Recreation Task Force recommendations uh, included three key areas that are in this bill. 
DNR would like to emphasize that these three key action areas in and of themselves with or without an office are extremely important. And these are first to increase participation by advancing equity, diversity and inclusivity. The task force emphasized making Minnesota a welcoming place for everyone. Secondly, uniting Minnesota's outdoor recreation community, the idea that all forms of outdoor recreation are important and by working together, we can enhance it for all of us. And thirdly, unifying communications around uh, diverse outdoor recreation sector and building some more cohesive narratives. So DNR, as well as the Department of Tourism are firmly behind these action areas. Collectively, we want to ensure that everyone feels welcome in the outdoors, that we lift up and acknowledge the importance of outdoor recreation in our state and in growing in our economy, and that we strive towards more cohesive messaging. These are areas that we're working hard in to advance in partnership with groups and Minnesotans. And we're happy to discuss some of this work further if time allows. It's also worth noting that these action areas are similar to recommendations from Minnesota's 25 years Parks and Trails Legacy Plan, as well as our statewide comprehensive outdoor recreation plan in which DNR is actively working on. So the importance is there and it's a question of how to do it. And there's really different ways to achieve these recommendations. The task force had a lot of discussions around how to achieve this and ultimately the majority of members landed on the idea of an office of outdoor recreation while acknowledging that there may be more than one way to do this. We found an important takeaway from the task force was the need to build upon the connection between public and nonprofit entities, such as the DNR and outdoor recreation groups, along with the outdoor recreation industry. And importantly, the task force acknowledged that uh, and recommended that DNR and other agencies can actively and already work on advancing these key action areas. So DNR and Explore Minnesota are committed to that. We know there's more work to do and we'd like to work with partners on that. A few perspectives on an independent Office of Outdoor Recreation. Though DNR is firmly behind the action areas in the recommendation, and we're working hard to make advances in these areas. We're not sure that creating a new Office of Outdoor Recreation is the most effective or efficient way to achieve those goals. Subdivision 4, for example, includes many elements of work that DNR is already involved in, along with other organizations such as the Department of Tourism. So it's possible that having another office in yet another state agency could have some elements of duplication. Similarly, the powers in subdivision five suggest significant employment of officers, employees and agents under this office. And it's not quite entirely clear what level of investment this will be and what that means for other agencies that are already doing uh, work in outdoor recreation. And finally, though some other states have established offices of outdoor recreation, Many have focused on benefits that may be different than the needs of Minnesota. For example, Minnesota already has a very strong grant program and is already seen as a leader in outdoor recreation in many ways. In closing, though DNR is not convinced that a new state office of outdoor recreation in another agency is the best practical solution, we're nonetheless committed to working together towards a more connected and inclusive outdoor recreation community that can really lift up those three key action areas. We all recognize the importance of outdoor recreation in our state. It may in fact be an untapped area of investment given the outsized benefits to our state. We think there's a variety of ways to expand these connections among outdoor recreation providers, industry and nonprofits, even without a new independent office. And we're ready to work with partners across Minnesota to continue to build these relationships to advance common goals. I'm also happy to answer any questions at the end of the presentations. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up, uh, Lauren Bennett McGinty, Explore Minnesota. Welcome and state your name for the record. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Lauren Bennett McGinty. I am the director of Explore Minnesota Tourism. Um, I will be brief in my remarks as Explore Minnesota uh, agrees with the statements that the DNR has made. We also understand the importance of outdoor recreation in the state and how it boosts our state's health, well-being, and economy, of course. And the goals put forward by the Outdoor Recreation Task Force are goals that Minnesota, Explore Minnesota Tourism and the DNR are working toward and hope to expand in the future as well. Our agency is currently going through a strategic planning process, and we plan not only to continue to incorporate these initiatives, but to increase the work that we're doing in these areas. 
The DNR has done an excellent job outlining many of the ways that we as state agencies can work together to accomplish these goals. And we too recommend or recognize that the recommendations are important to increase participation and in bringing unity to the importance of outdoor recreation in Minnesota, especially in relation to safe, affordable and accessible tourism. Um, I'd like to quickly touch on parts of this bill that are already in progress at its for Minnesota tourism. Currently, we spend about 65% or $3 million on marketing campaigns to promote outdoor recreation within the public and private sectors and to welcome all visitors to participate in every outdoor activity, including but definitely not limited to paddling sports, hiking, mountain biking, winter sports, camping, fishing, and more. We coordinate with the DNR regularly, statewide associations, and national and state park authorities to promote and facilitate a culture of welcoming everyone to the outdoors. We currently do work directly with other government agencies, tribal nations, for-profit companies, and advertising outlets to promote outdoor activities and work with region-specific groups to promote visitation to our natural wonders and outdoor activations. I anticipate we will grow these areas in the next several months and had put significant time and investment during COVID into outdoor recreation promotion as it was one of the safer activities to do during that time. We also regularly connect with various outdoor recreation offices and entities like Voyagers National Park or the Boundary Waters to ensure that our marketing is promoting responsible and sustainable travel to these areas so that we can maintain their beauty for generations to come. We agree that the creation of an Office of Outdoor Recreation is perhaps not the best path forward, but along with DNR, we will be dedicated to working together to accomplish the goals outlined in the proposed bill language. We are dedicated to working more closely with the outdoor recreation community to bring forward an outdoor experience that serves more underrepresented communities and creates more equitable and accessible landscape for Minnesotans and visitors alike. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ray Aponte, member, Outdoor Recreation Working Group. Welcome and state your name for the record. Mr. Chair, I don't see him on the list, on the, the room list. Okay. Katie Freeze, Winnebago Industries, welcome. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. I'm Katie Freeze, Vice President of Corporate Responsibility at Winnebago Industries, an outdoor lifestyle company now proudly headquartered in Minnesota. Outdoor recreation is a way of life for many, as well as a prominent economic driver in Minnesota, where it generates more than $8 billion annually. The RV industry alone has an annual economic impact in this state of $2.4 billion, while employing more than 14,000 Minnesotans. We've heard really excellent points uh, from, from several of my colleagues who served with me on the Minnesota Outdoor Recreation Task Force. Um, many facets of state government already support and promote Minnesota's outdoor recreation opportunities, and we thank them for their role. A Minnesota Outdoor Recreation Office would add unique value coordinating these efforts and ensuring unity, as well as efficiency among outdoor recreation stakeholders and government. The office would also help play a prominent role in expanding access to the outdoors and nature-based experiences for Minnesotans. Together with the Minnesota Outdoor Recreation Office, we will ensure that all Minnesotans and visitors to our great state feel a sense of belonging in the outdoors. We've heard the benefits um, of a strong place-based outdoor culture. We Businesses will and states will be able to attract new businesses, recruit and retain employees. Uh, we'll improve urban and rural quality of life, attract more visitors, create sustainable local econ economies. Um, um, and as a member of the Minnesota Outdoor Recreation Task Force, we spent a significant amount of time over the last year plus really understanding and seeing the incredible benefits that 18 other states are beginning to realize with an outdoor recreation office. We do believe it is time Minnesota commits to creating an outdoor recreation office. And I very much thank Representative Dabney for bringing this forward and committee members for considering um, and supporting HF 4356. Thank you. <clears throat> Ms. Fries, welcome uh, Winnebago to Minnesota. Uh, it's an iconic industry uh, and uh, we're glad that you moved here and that uh, uh, we hope we can help out whatever we can. So uh, thank Absolutely. you for being here. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, we have also up available for questions, Amy K. Kerber with the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources and Gary Michael, they are available. Uh, we have five questions and I'm gonna go in the order they came in. So it'll be Representative Igo, Representative Jordan, Representative Green, Representative Becker Finn, and then Representative Backer. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So uh, I guess my first question uh, is gonna be for the bill author, Representative Dabney. You know, we had a lot of presenters today talking about this bill. One group that was very absent is the locally funded tourism groups, chambers, all these groups that are locally funded by the community to do this kind of work. And I'm really concerned we're gonna see overlap and, and their messaging getting taken away. So were those groups consulted at all? Mr. Chair, thank you, Mr. Chair. You know, the voices of those groups have been in, involved uh, in the past. Uh, the purpose, part of the purpose of the office is to coordinate and facilitate. And obviously those folks on the ground are key parts of the outdoor recreation industry and therefore uh, key contacts and constituents for an independent office of outdoor recreation. Representative Michael. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So my concern here is when we create state agencies, uh, we get away from the best form of government, which I think all of us agree is local government, right? Um, and when we're creating more state agencies, my fear is we have commissioners, we have leaders inside that new agency that now can steer the message away from what maybe works best for that local region, whether it be the office in Ely that you're proposing or the office in Winona. I think we really need to consider maybe instead of spending money on a new state agency, we start looking at how we can infuse more money into local tourism groups and local chambers. I'm pretty sure that was what the, the DNR and Explore Minnesota is getting at as they have very great venture groups into our regions around the state and have been doing a great job in state recreation. I think that maybe that this bill is, has good intentions, but maybe the money should be intended to go to the groups that already exist rather than looking to grow government. Representative Dabney. I appreciate your perspective, Representative Eichel. Representative Jordan. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Chair Dabney, for all of your work on this over the years. I know this is a um, personal personal passion of yours as someone who's a great advocate for um, especially children getting outside and having those experiential learning. I am I know that there's a lot of trends in other states that have instituted these offices of outdoor recreation. I think Colorado um, was the first, but we've also seen even neighboring states like Michigan that have similar amenities-based economies to Minnesota. Um, take on these offices of outdoor recreation. What changes um, have these other states um, seen with their um, amenities-based economy or outdoor recreation after having, like the, what's the before and after of having one of these offices? Tim Dabney. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Jordan, for that question. I think you heard it from uh, Mr. Groon, the increased growth in the outdoor recreation sector compared to the, the overall economy in some of those uh, neighboring states that have pioneered these offices of outdoor recreation. I uh, said there were 14 other states, Ms. Sims uh, gently corrected me. Uh, it's 18 other states that are engaged in this same sort of process and are yielding these benefits. Uh, when somebody's doing something that works and we're not, I think we should do what works. Representative Jordan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, Chair Dabney for that. Um, another area of concern that we both share is um, the well-being of children um, and having children have more experiential learning. Can you talk about some of the um, ways that this office would be better be able to engage um, getting more kids outside, especially um, in our districts like um, here in Minneapolis? But we know that there is a there's a lack of there's there's the lack of there's less ability for kids to get outside across the state. So what are some of the effects that this would have on children? And I also know that. Um, we have some testifiers here who could specifically talk more about the effects that this would have on children and their education. Representative Dabney. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You know, I, I, I defer much of the of this to Ms. Milligan Toffler from the Children and Nature Network. Uh, I was sorry that Mr. Aponte wasn't able to, to join this morning. He's with the Lopit Foundation uh, that's headquartered in North Minneapolis, runs an internationally recognized uh, program uh, in outdoor recreation and his work is 
uh, much with the children of North Minneapolis, engaging them with the outdoor opportunities that are right there, building skills in life, uh, lifelong sports uh, that they can then uh, engage in throughout their life. It's a great example of what we can do when we harness the opportunities and, and, and work uh, in a focused manner. Representative Green. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, question for the author of the bill, and I see some of my questions have already been asked, but uh, um, this, it's been stated that this was dupl duplicative, and I've seen that when I read the bill. And, and I'm just wondering, is it the author's intention, if this bill should pass, is, are these uh, obligations going to be stripped away from the other, other programs, such as the No Child Left Inside or the, or the ICANN programs that the DNR is funding? Or are we just going to continue to stack on more and more uh, entities and agencies to do the same thing? And, and, uh, and then where's the money coming from? Are we going to be stripping it from other, uh, other programs? Or is there some form of, of other revenue that you intend to uh, take this from? Representative Dabney. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And Representative Green, if you look at the Outdoor Recreation Task Force report, what you see is coordination um, amongst the different players in the outdoor recreation industry, uniting uh, efforts in the outdoor recreation industry. Not talking about stripping away, but better coordinating, facilitating, engaging, enhancing the work that, that's being done uh, locally as well as on the state level. Representative Becker Finn. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, you know, this this isn't a, a new idea. We've been talking about the Outdoor uh, Recreation Task Force uh, over the past couple of years. Um, I just wanted to bring up, I know I brought this up in previous years, but I, I don't think the word recreation is actually the best word for what we're trying to accomplish here. And I think, you know, recreation gives us the idea that it's just about our enjoyment. And this is really about much more than that. I, I know personally um, that access to the outdoors and being able to spend time outside and engage with the outdoors it, it is much more than just something I do for fun. Um, and I think that's true for a lot of communities and a lot of people. And um, so I just, a, as this moves forward and we continue these conversations, I think if we, we think about the word engagement, um, I think that might be better capture what it is that we're trying to do here, because I think access to the outdoors and being able to move your body outside is really, I honestly see it as more of a human right. You know, it really connects to our ability to be healthy um, in multiple ways. And so I, I don't need a response, but just wanted to, to share that perspective with everybody. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Representative Dabney. Representative Backer. Representative Backer. Representative Heinzman Lewick or Lewick Heinzman. Here. Uh, Representative Lewick here. Uh, I guess uh, I'm curious as to uh, why we would, uh, any, any concept of what we intend to pay is supposedly this new director and uh, why, uh, why don't we have uh, sufficient capacity already uh, uh, between the DNR and uh, uh, Explore Minnesota, uh, I still don't. I still don't get it. Uh, why we're adding a new wheel to uh, to the system? Representative Dabney. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative Lewick, for the question. If you go back and listen to the task force members, uh, the majority of them found that an independent office would best facilitate growing Minnesota's outdoor recreation business, business opportunities and, and employment opportunities, as well as engagement with uh, Minnesotans and tourists coming into the state to enjoy our natural resources and uh, engage to bear, pick up on Representative Becker Finn's language, engage in those activities. Um, I, we, we empowered a group of citizens to come together and study the questions. They came forward with a report that uh, strongly uh, empowered and independent office. And I believe we should, as legislators, listen to citizens' voices. 
Uh, uh, thank, thank, thank you for that for that answer. Um, I guess uh, I, I see some real uh, uh, a dichotomy with the concept of an independent office that would be ran by the state government. I would suggest that uh, uh, not to, uh, folks who put this uh, proposal together certainly got a sincere effort. But if they truly want to be independent and be able to chart a legitimate uh, uh, course in this area, then the last thing in the world they need to do is to slide this underneath the thumb of, uh, of the state government. Uh, I, would, I would suggest that it's more appropriate that they truly remain independent uh, and uh, uh, continue on the process of form their own association, their own representative uh, 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 system. Uh, and speak independent of the state government, because I can tell you uh, uh, that is uh, they, there's nothing independent about handing a, a new uh, addition to state government and assuming that it's going to do what you anticipate it's going to do. Uh, just just words of caution here. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Davney, any closing comments? Uh, Mr. Chair, members, thank you much for the opportunity to present. Uh, House file 4356 this morning. I'm a strong believer uh, in the outdoors. I'm a strong believer in Minnesota. I'm a strong believer that moving forward with the recommendations of the task force uh, that this committee empowered uh, will enhance both of those. I want to thank the testifiers for taking time uh, early on a Friday morning to join us and uh, provide their insights today. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, members. Thank you. I will renew my motion in House file 43. 4356 be laid over for possible inclusion in an omnibus bill. The bill is laid over. Next up, House File 2904, Representative Lippert. Representative Lippert, will you move that House File 2904 be recommended to be re referred to the Transportation, Finance, and Policy Committee? So moved, Mr. Chair. Representative Lippert, you have an author's amendment. Would you move the A3 amendment and explain your amendment briefly? I move the A3 amendment and simply fills in the, uh, uh, the blanks with. Uh, financial allocations, and I'll explain that a little bit more as I present the bill. Representative Lippert moves the A3 amendment to get the bill in the form he would like. Any discussion? Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. Ayes have it. The Lippert amendment A3 is adopted. We have three testifiers, and then we will have another amendment, and there will be testimony on that amendment. First, uh, Representative Lippert, to your bill. As Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the goal of this bill is to plant a tree for every Minnesotan in each of the next four years. Uh, 5.7 million additional trees planted per year in each of the next four years. Planting trees is one of the simplest things we can do to naturally sequester carbon and mitigate climate change. The Nature Conservancy estimates that this bill can naturally sequester more than 1 million tons of CO2, the equivalent of, equivalent of taking 300,000 vehicles off the road. In addition, planting trees is a simple thing we can do to improve the health of our environment. Preventing soil erosion, improving water quality, air quality, providing habitat. Planting trees also improves the resiliency and livability of our communities too, cooling shaded areas significantly during heat waves. The strategy of this bill is to build on existing programs and provide one-time funding as follows. $8 million to Bowser for accelerated conservation plantings across the state with $500,000 of that going to invasive species control, $4 million going to MnDOT's Living Snow Fence Program, to provide more trees along county roadways, strategically placed to stop the snow, improve safety for drivers and save counties and townships money, and then $10 million going to communities to help them address both the loss of trees due to emerald ash borer, and also to help communities do the preventive tree replacement needed to try to get ahead and stay ahead of the spread of the ash borer. Another aspect of the EAB section is, to, is a prioritization of environmental justice areas to be sure we're working to replace the urban canopy that's been lost in communities with lower household incomes and in communities with high numbers of people of color and people learning the English language. So I have a few testifiers with me who can say more and I'll turn it over to them now. First up, uh, David Bennett, City of Northfield. Welcome and state your name for the record. Thank you, Chair and Committee Members, Dave Bennett with the City of Northfield. I'm the Public Works Director, City Engineer. So I just want to give a, a local perspective um, of the city. So we knew Emerald Ashbor was coming. We've heard from other states and when it arrived. So, so Northfield 
On our public property, we have nearly 2,000 ash trees. It's about 16% of our urban forest or 20% of the biomass of all the trees. So like a lot of agencies, the city plan. So in 2017, we, uh, we adopted a plan to really be proactive in our approach to emerald ash floor. We were gonna remove 50% of the, the smaller ash trees and then replace those trees and then treat the, the larger trees. And, th and that came at a cost of a little over a million and a half dollars. So really from 2017 till now, we, we really struggled to implement and find the funding for that program. The city's reached out for grants and applied. We applied three times unsuccessful. This last year in 21, we were successful. So um, we were able to secure funding. I think it's just been a challenge at the local agencies to, to find the funding to implement plans that have been created. And, and one of the challenges is we, we don't have Emerald Ashport yet discovered in Northfield. Um, we know it's coming, it hasn't arrived yet, but just the, to get these pre preventative plans in place to try to get ahead of it, it's been a challenge uh, to fund. Thank you. Next up, Karen Zuma. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. My name is Karen Zumach, and I am the current president of the Minnesota Shade Tree Advisory Committee. Uh, the Minnesota Shade Tree Advisory Committee is a 500 plus member organization of urban and community forestry professionals, advocates, and citizens of our state whose mission is to be the leading advocate for Minnesota's community forests and to empower and educate all of Minnesota's citizens to maximize the coverage, health, quality, function, and future of our community for us. As such, we'd like to offer our support for Representative Lippert's House File 2904. And while we extend our support to all sections of this bill, we'd like to draw specific attention to section three. As Mr. Bennett indicated, EAB is a considerable burden for communities and we'd like to extend support for the ash tree replacement grants. As this committee is well aware, the impacts of EAB are currently being felt across large portions of our state. And a friendly reminder that Minnesota has the highest population of ash trees of anywhere in our nation and therefore the most to lose and the most to manage. Of those 1 million ash trees, 3 million of them stand in our built environment, our cities and towns. These, the cost associated with the removal and replanting of these trees is astronomical and will continue to increase as more and more trees die to this invasive pest. Research has shown that over one ash tree's lifetime, it will store upwards of four metric tons of carbon. When we consider what we are losing when, we ulti when ultimately millions of ash trees disappear from our landscape, the impacts to our air and water quality, as well as our community's abilities to adapt to increasing disruptions caused by climate change, we must be spurred to action. The now retired science, senior scientist from the US Forest Service has been quoted as saying, trees in urban areas reduce air temperatures, shade surfaces, and consequently alter building energy use. On a per tree basis, urban trees offer the greatest potential to reduce climate change, as not only do they sequester carbon, but they also can provide a permanent reduction in greenhouse gas emissions through reduced energy use. Additionally, trees grown in the urban environment have the ability to capture and store four times as much carbon as those grown in traditional forested areas. But there's one caveat. They must not only survive in the harsh urban environment, they must also thrive. And to thrive, these trees rely on us. Replanting trees lost to EAB is one important component of rebuilding and sustaining our critical urban and community forests. Replanting alone will not deliver the critical benefits the climate crisis requires. Ensuring those trees are climate adaptive and able to withstand the changes our state will face is vitally important to ensuring resilient urban community forests for the future. In addition to replanting, we encourage the legislature to consider programs associated with rebuilding the tree canopy now and into the future to include allowable reimbursement for ash tree removals. We cannot mandate the removal of dead ash trees without providing additional support for the financial burden these trees cause. Young tree maintenance. Mm. Newly planted trees need attention just like a baby. 
specifically in their first three years. Weekly watering and structural pruning are critical inputs necessary for our urban and community forests to deliver on the carbon capturing benefits we request of them. And finally, mature tree preservation. Additional resources need to be included for the outreach and education necessary to highlight the benefits of our carbon capturing heroes, the large trees that also require investment in order to continue to deliver these important benefits. Thank you for the ongoing consideration of these investments. In the words of Russell Page, a world renowned British gardener, to plant trees is to give body and life to one's dreams of a better world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up, Jim Calkins, welcome. State your name and who you're with for the record. Thank you, Chair Hansen and community members. My name is James Calkins, and I am a nursery production and landscape horticulturist and a member of the Minnesota Nursery and Landscape Association, MNLA, a professional association that represents businesses like my horticultural consulting and landscape design business and other green industry businesses throughout the state, including nursery growers, garden centers, landscape designers and managers, tree care professionals, and a variety of allied industries. I am also a graduate of the University of Minnesota with a PhD in horticultural science and serve on the Minnesota Invasive Species Advisory Council and the Minnesota Department of Agriculture and Noxious Weed Advisory Committee. And I am also past president of the Minnesota Shade Tree Advisory Committee. I thank you for the opportunity to testify on House File 2904, which seeks to appropriate money for an accelerated conservation planting program, living snow fences, and the replacement of ash trees lost to emerald ash borer. I support and the MNLA supports funding that will incentivize the acquisition and planting of trees, shrubs, and herbaceous species to benefit the environment and human well being. All three of the programs proposed in House File 2904 appear to be worthy of support in this regard. And I thank Representative Lippert and the other authors for their efforts to bring this bill forward. This said, it is concerning that the current language of the bill states that the money appropriated may only be used to acquire and plant trees native to Minnesota. Although I am an enthusiastic supporter of planting native species when the conditions are suitable and would like to see them used more often than they are, the reality is, is that both native and non-native trees uh, species can provide significant benefits, including but not limited to improved air quality, enhanced stormwater mitigation, reduced heat island effects, and valuable wildlife, wildlife habitat, and only using native species in urban and suburban areas tends to limit species diversity, as many native species do not perform well under urbanized conditions where elevated temperatures, drought, high pH, compacted soil, salt exposure, flooding, and other stressors are commonplace. Sugar maple, one of the most revered and popular native trees in the state, is a good example. It just doesn't perform well under stressful conditions. In some cases, and for a variety of reasons, native species may otherwise not be well suited to certain landscape situations or may not be widely expect, accepted by a large segment of the landscaping public. In the latter case, a native requirement can actually discourage people from creating habitats that include native species compared to landscapes that allow the inclusion of both native and non-native species. And finally, creating a diverse plant community using only native species is especially difficult for trees as the number of native species that work on boulevards and other tough sites is quite limited and getting smaller as a result of susceptibility to introduce pests and diseases. History has hopefully taught us that planting a diverse population of adapted trees, shrubs, and herbaceous plants is extremely important and will impart climate resi resiliency and help reduce the impact of invasive plant pests that are already present in Minnesota and others that will likely find their way to Minnesota in the future. Instead of limiting the plants that qualify for funding under the, under the commendable initiatives outlined in House File 2904 to native species only, Encouraging planting a mix of cold hardy and otherwise adapted native and introduced species as appropriate for a given situation with the goal of establishing a diversity of species that maximizes resiliency and the many benefits provided by trees and other plants. It is a much wiser choice and an easy fix. 
I ask you to support this worthwhile legislation with amended language that incentivizes planting a diversity of both native and non-native plant species that are not invasive and are adapted to Minnesota's climate and the conditions of a given site. I also encourage the legislature to expand the focus to include the replacement of other tree species that are being killed by other pests and diseases like old wilt, old wilt and to consider prioritizing Minnesota growers as the source for the plants envisioned by the initiatives in this and similar leg legislation. As a bit of an aside, although it's also been mentioned by my colleague Karen Zumak, it looks like this year may be the beginning of widespread losses of ash trees due to attack by emerald ash borer, and this is going to present a very real and significant challenge to municipalities and Minnesotans. I encourage support for treating larger, healthy ash trees that provide significant environmental and socioeconomic benefits and funding for the removal and replacement of trees that have been lost to EAB and other serious tree pests, so long as replacement is tied to removal to maintain and increase tree canopy. Thank you for your interest and time, and I would be happy to any, answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Representative Keeler, I believe you have an A1 amendment. Would you like to move and explain your amendment? Um, I would, Mr. Chair. Um, so this amendment came up uh, in conversations with the author of the bill. Um, it's really from the seventh generation mind frame that when we talk about uh, taking care of Mother Earth and using our next generations, to me, the the, um, one of the obvious spaces was partnering with our schools. Uh, one of our elementary schools in my community did a really awesome project with planting different trees. Um, not only did it prov provide opportunities for our kids to get involved, but also all the other benefits that we know um, impact Mother Earth. And so I did bring somebody with me today, Mr. Chair. Um, I'll yield the rest of my time so she can tell the story of, of what we did in our community as an example um, of what these grants would be in the amendment. Representative Keeler moves the A1 amendment. Heather Niesmeyer is here uh, to testify. Welcome to the committee and state your name for the record. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, committee members. My name is Heather Niesmeyer, and I'm a former officer of uh, the Parent Teacher Advisory Council for Ellen Hopkins Elementary uh, School in Moorhead, Minnesota. And I'm a current volunteer at Ellen Hopkins Elementary. I included a handout for the committee to review as well um, with some history and some photos of our experience. Um, it res uh, specifically refers to the impact of House File 209, the Keeler Amendment, and how it would be impactful. Um, specifically, our PTAC um, had uh, a wonderful idea in expanding our three community gardens, and we chose to plant 30 fruit trees and um, some cherry bushes to impact our community and um, build our educational space. So these are outdoor educational spaces and increasing our community's biodiversity. And this amendment would specifically be able to address that statewide. Um, our experience was transitioning that turf grass and allowing these children and teachers for our elementary school, but also the entire community, those who have um, childcare, daycare, at-home schools, um, as well as private schools that are nearby to use this space for engaging in experiential learning, as well as addressing their standards in math, science, and literacy. One of my favorite things is watching children their books outside and reading in the fruit orchard. But um, many of our um, families at our elementary school um, are challenged with um, access to free and, um, or access to free, uh, uh, I'm so sorry, um, have uh, difficulties accessing uh, fresh fruits and vegetables. And so they're on the free and reduced lunch program. And so having that, um, those community gardens and more importantly, the um, fruit orchard, they're able to access um, not only the process of how those fruits and vegetables grow, but they can walk up right up to the trees, pluck them off the a tree and bring them home or eat them right there in the fruit orchard. And this amendment allowing the collaboration with the parent uh, organization and the schools, allowing those children to help plant the trees, watch them grow and come back and visit them for years to come would really impact all of our Minnesota communities. And I urge you to support this amendment and um, 
watch our communities grow for many generations to come. Thank you. Representative Keeler has moved the A1 amendment. Representative Lippert, do you have a position on the amendment? Yes, Mr. Chair, I'm excited about this amendment. Appreciate Representative Keeler's leadership on it. And thank including students and schools and parents in this work is, is great. So I support this amendment. Is there any discussion? Is there any discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? The ayes have it, the motion prevails. Uh, questions from members to the bill as amended. Representative Lippert, any closing comments? I'd simply say that um, I have heard concerns about native language from a few places and I'm currently working on um, updated language and we'll do that as the bill continues to travel. Uh, but uh, this is a great bill. Let's plant some trees, Mr. Chair. Representative Lippert renews his motion that House File 2904 as amended be recommended to be re-referred to the Transportation Finance Policy and Committee. The clerk will take the roll. Chair Hansen. Aye. Chair Hansen votes aye. Vice Chair Wozlowick. Wozlowick, aye. Wozlowick votes aye. Representative Heinzman. No. Heinzman votes no. Representative Acom. Acom, aye. Acom votes aye. Representative Ackland. No. Ackland votes no. Representative Backer. Backer, no. Backer votes no. Representative Becker Finn. Becker Finn, aye. Becker Finn votes aye. Representative Eklund. Aye. Representative Eklund votes aye. Representative Fisher. Fisher, aye. Fisher votes aye. Representative Green. No. Green votes no. Representative Igo. Igo votes no. Representative Igo votes no. Representative Jordan. Jordan, aye. Jordan votes aye. Representative Keeler. Keeler, aye. Keeler votes aye. Representative Lee. Lee, aye. Lee votes aye. Representative Lippert. Lippert, aye. Lippert votes aye. Representative Lewick. Lewick, no. Lewick votes no. Representative Morrison. Morrison, aye. Morrison votes aye. Representative Nelson. Nelson votes no. Nelson votes no. Representative Tice. Tice votes no. Tice votes no. Mr. Chair, there are 11 ayes and eight nays. The motion prevails. Uh, next up, House File 4360, Representative Becker Finn. Representative Becker Finn, will you move that House File 4360 be recommended to be re referred to the Judiciary, Finance, and Civil Law Committee? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, that is my motion. Representative Becker Finn also has an author's amendment. Representative Becker Finn, will you move the A1 amendment? Explain your amendment briefly. Uh, yep, I move the A1 amendment. It is a purely technical, technical amendment that changes uh, the letter A to the letter C. Representative Beckerfin moves the A1 amendment to get the bill in the form the author would like. Any discussion? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. The amendment is adopted. Uh, Representative Beckerfin, to your bill. I thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, and thank you, uh, members. Uh, so today, uh, House File 4360 uh, in, it ad addresses pipeline abandonment. <clears throat> We've had a lot of discussion over the last couple of years about um, putting in new pipelines, but this bill addresses the issue of pipeline abandonment, which in our current climate situation is, is likely to be an issue we will continue to talk about in the coming years. Uh, specifically, uh, the bill does kind of has things in two areas. Uh, first, it would require that the owner of a pipeline has to put together a pipeline abandonment plan and that that plan has to be approved uh, by the Commissioner of Public Safety I, and for folks who don't under, uh, are not familiar, uh, a lot of pop pipeline uh, safety issues are overseen by the Department of Public Safety, so that's keeping in line with uh, their current responsibilities. And then most importantly, um, the second part that this bill does is it returns more power to landowners and uh, actual people who live in our communities as far as what happens when a pipeline that runs through their property uh, is abandoned. And it uh, requires that the pipeline company um, is 
responsible for the cost to remove uh, that pipeline equipment um, and everything involved with that, if that's what the landowner wants. Um, and so it really sets that. So we know right at the beginning that that is the expectation and that um, the rights of Minnesotans and their, their land um, takes precedent over, you know, what, some uh, corporate entity might think is in their best interest. So that's a really short summary. I know we're short for time today. And uh, I do, there are a couple, I know there's uh, a couple testifiers signed up and I am more than happy to get in deeper if folks have questions. Uh, so I will turn it over to uh, one of my testifiers, uh, Mr. Chair. First up, Sam Benson, Minnesota Interfaith Power and Light. Welcome to the committee and state your name for the record. My name is Sam Benson, and I'm on staff with Minnesota Interfaith Power and Light. Uh, thank you, Chair and Committee members. Um, our organization works with faith communities from across the state to advocate for action to address climate change and environmental stewardship. I appreciate the opportunity to appear before the committee and speak in favor of HF 4360. Our organization has been engaging in advocacy around oil pipelines for years. We view this bill as a step in the right direction to ensure that pipeline companies cannot simply abandon pipelines after they are no longer in use. Currently, the state does not require pipeline companies to clean up their waste. We all learn at a young age the importance of cleaning up after ourselves. In this spirit, HF 4360 would require pipeline companies to remove pipelines after they're no longer in use or to develop detailed plans for abandonment. This will help to protect natural habitats and will do right by landowners. All landowners should have the option of having their land cleaned up. Under the current system, landowners are forced to navigate an intimidating process that was designed by pipeline companies simply to ensure that the abandoned pipeline is removed from their land. This legislation would help to protect landowners and hold large corporations like Enbridge accountable for cleaning up after themselves. During the approval process, construction, and aftermath of the building of the Line 3 Tar Sands Pipeline, our organization and our partners went, witnessed numerous ways in which the state's regulatory process fell short in protecting our state's natural resources. While this legislation by no means rectifies all of those problems, it does mark a positive step in the right direction, and we're happy to support it. Thank you to the committee for your time. Thank you. Next up, Mark Piazza, American Petroleum Institute. Chair Hansen, members of the committee, good morning to everyone and thank you for the opportunity to testify. My name is Mark Piazza. I'm a senior policy advisor at the American Petroleum Institute, commonly referred to as API. On behalf of API, I'm providing this testimony to voice our concern with the proposed House File 4360, which relates to the disposition of abandoned pipelines and development and approval of pipeline abandonment plans. The natural gas and oil industry is committed to the safe and environmentally responsible operation of U.S. energy infrastructure. U.S. pipelines safely deliver oil, natural gas, and their products to Americans every day, and the industry is committed to its goal of operating with zero incidents through robust safety programs and a deployment of advanced inspection and leak detection technologies. Pipeline operators' proactive prevention, preparedness, and response efforts help ensure the safe transportation of energy across the U.S. and provide American consumers with affordable, reliable energy while protecting the communities and environment where operators live and work. API represents all segments of America's natural gas and oil industry, which supports more than 11 million U.S. jobs and is backed by a growing grassroots movement of millions of Americans. Our nearly 600 members produce, process, and distribute the majority of the nation's energy and participate in the API Energy Excellence Program which is accelerating environmental and safety progress by fostering new technologies and transparent reporting. API was formed in 1919 as a standard setting organization and has developed more than 700 standards to enhance operational and environmental safety, efficiency, and sustainability. Uh, industry initiatives and best practices developed in collaboration with federal and state regulatory requirements have established industry-wide guidelines for construction, operation, maintenance and abandonment of pipelines. The energy industry's best practices for pipeline abandonment have been established in API's recommended practice 1181, pipeline operating status determination. API's recommended practice 1181 outlines guidelines for establishing the operating status of a pipeline and the maintenance procedures recommended for each operating status, including abandonment best practices 
and any related regulatory requirements and reporting. These best practices ensure a safe, consistent, and clear process for all stakeholders involved. Uh, pipeline operators need clear and consistent regulations with a transparent rulemaking process to provide the affordable, reliable energy American consumers demand. HF 4360 contradicts federal guidelines and could create regulatory uncertainty, hampering the development of vital energy infrastructure. API is concerned that the proposed pipeline abandonment language and approaches presented in HF 4360 are unclear and places an unnecessary burden on state agencies, landowners, and pipeline operators. There are existing federal, state, and local regulations that address issues like erosion control, pipe disposal, water quality monitoring, and other issues related to pipeline abandonment. Other issues in HF 360, such as pipe composition and maintenance history that are uh, included in the abandonment plans, are also covered by federal, state, and local regulations on pipeline operation and safety, and are not issues related to pipeline abandonment. The proposed definition of pipeline abandonment in HF 4360 is not consistent with federal regulations in 49 CFR Part 195, which defines pipeline abandonment on the basis of being permanently removed from service. Pipeline owners often temporar temporarily cease operations of sections of pipelines or entire pipelines with the deliberate intent of restoring service in the future, mainti maintaining the pipelines in an idle status consistent with guidelines established by the U.S. Department of Transportation, Pipeline and Hazardous Materials Safety Administration. Pipeline operators work closely with landowners and community stakeholders, either through the current regulatory process or established easement agreements from the pipeline's construction to ensure minimal impacts to the local community and environment during the pipeline abandonment process. HF 4360's proposed pipeline abandonment process does not consider the wide range of environments and conditions across hundreds of miles of pipeline and multiple independent landowners' properties that a pipeline may intersect. The legislation also fails to provide a clear timeline for its abandonment plan requirements, which could lead to unnecessary confusion between regulators, pipeline operators, landowners, and other stakeholders. The proposed legislation is duplicative of the existing process and provides unclear, cumbersome guidance that at times contradicts existing regulations and best practices. At a time of rising energy prices and geopolitical turmoil, lawmakers should focus on policies that support production and development of America's energy resources, including expanding critical energy infrastructure like pipelines. Increasing pipeline capacity will ensure Minnesotans have access to affordable and reliable energy to cook the food we eat, heat the homes we live in, and power the vehicles and factories that we depend on every day. Acknowledging the public good, the broad Mr. public Piazza, good. Piazza, if you could wrap up, please. Then. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. So, so thank, uh, I'll stop there. Thank you for the opportunity to share the industry concern with HS4360. We stand ready to work with community members and provide education on best practices being implemented by the industry. If we can be of any assistance on this or other legislative matters, please don't hesitate to contact us. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Stand ready for questions. I thank you, Mr. Chair. And I would just say, um, as far as the cost of energy to normal people like all of us, um, if uh, corporate oil CEOs didn't make $24 million a year, um, perhaps um, that is more to blame for uh, keeping prices down. So um, I know we're short on time and I want to get to member discussion. So uh, we'll just leave it at that. Uh, Mr. Chair. Questions from members? Uh, Representative Heinzman or Representative Lewick? Or is it Lewick Heinzman? <laughs> well, we, go ahead, Representative. Oh, well, uh, uh, Representative Lewick here. Um, I find it ironic that uh, uh, we have to uh, look and considering the current situation, uh, in uh, Eastern Europe uh, and the issue of energy uh, and how it can be used as a uh, as a weapon that we would, uh, uh, <laughs> I guess, uh, finalize our presentation with a comment about uh, uh, what the industry pays uh, uh, corporate people. Uh, uh, sort of misses the point. Uh, uh, don't have a question here, just a simple comment that uh, this is more than duplicative and 
I realize that there are those that will categorically make statements that are not uh, factual as to uh, what the requirements are for removing pipelines, uh, for laying them up temporarily, and 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 for permanently uh, abandoning them, leaving them in the in the ground. Uh, and uh, but uh, this is a, this is a bill uh, chasing a problem that uh, doesn't frankly exist. We've got sufficient state and federal regulations. We'd be better focused on ensuring that uh, uh, we properly uh, enforce those. And uh, uh, you know, if you're if you're really that paranoid about what uh, CEOs are making in the industry, uh, maybe we should start passing laws that uh, uh, put in uh, some kind of uh, uh, let's mandate wages for everybody. I mean, uh, let's let's uh, uh, let's stay focused on uh, energy. And if you uh, really uh, really don't understand how fundamental that is to uh, not just here, but the, the world situation. Uh, uh, I would hope we'd wake up. Representative, Representative Lewick, I'm gonna caution. I'm gonna yep, caution I'm about, done. I'm gonna caution about not only intent, but uh, you know, using words like paranoid and um, don't understand. We just continue to get these things about members not, uh, you know, not, it's not in questioning motive, it's just, Making declarative state statements about each other, and well, I think we I, all can, and I think we can all do better. Yeah, you have that opinion. You've stated it, but to the yeah. bill, the bill is about a plan, and requiring a plan for abandonment. So I understand. Yeah. I understand everybody's got their opinions, but I'm just saying we've got to do better about when we're testifying. That's all of us. Mr. Paul, Chair, I have Representative a question, Lewis. if it's okay. <laughs> Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, no, a couple, actually, and to the bill author, Representative Becker Finn. Uh, I'm trying to trying to understand, and I'm not trying to assume anything, but if you could maybe give us an idea of some of the feedback. I'm sure you've spoken to the PUC and other folks that may be involved, maybe even pipeline operators. I, I'd love to get an idea what the feedback was. And, and then I'd also like to know, um, is there something specifically, Representative Becker Finn, that you have identified in state statute or federal law that prompted the writing of this bill? Um, Representative Lewick touched on it, but you know, if you could address those two things, that would be super helpful. Representative Becker Finn. I, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I appreciate your comments. And it, it's not actually funny; it's it's disrespectful um, the way that in many of our committees we we speak to each other. And I really appreciate your comments. And um, it's not paranoid; it's just facts. Uh, to to the question uh, from uh, Representative Heinzman, we what we learned in the last couple of years is that the PUC process is dense and difficult and really can only be focused on the things that the PUC under the statute, what they're able to address. And what I've been hearing from people, landowners, um, especially the folks in my home community up north, is that they don't feel like they have any power in this process. And so what this does and what this bill is really about, it's about after the fact. It's not about current use of the pipelines. It's about when it's done. And when it's done, whose responsibility is it to clean it up and to decide what happens? And um, what I have heard from folks is that they don't feel like they really have a lot of power in that situation. And so what we're trying to ad address with this bill is to give that power back to the landowners um, and to to get to the actual bill, if the landowner is fine with the equipment staying there and you know, for however, over time, uh, the land has been built up around that, the vegetation, whatever it is, if it's their choice to keep it there, they can choose that. And so that's what really what this is about is returning some power to actual people who own land um, in our state. So that's that's where it's, it's coming from. Again, like it, it's, uh, sort of a question to motives, but like, I, I, I get, I get the question and there isn't some like ulterior vindictive nonsense. Sure. It's, it's really about, um, it's really about answering that question. Mr. Chair, 
Um, just to remind everybody, my question was there a specific issue or shortcoming that has been identified by the bill author? I wasn't questioning anybody's motive. I was also asking if the bill author had consulted with the PUC, talked to the PC, PUC, or even maybe even talked to those affected uh, pipeline operators and so on and so forth. And it wasn't addressed in any of those comments. If I missed it, I apologize. Representative those are the questions that I had. Yep. Yep, Representative Heinzman, I, that's what I was answering about your question about where it was coming from. The, the concern is actual people with land that pipelines go across their land and what happens. So that's, that's what we're addressing. The current setup with most of the power being with the PUC in that process does not engage actual people who own land in these places in a way that's meaningful to them. So that's where that's coming from. I have uh, been trading phone calls uh, with uh, current and former uh, members of the PUC. Uh, obviously, we're up against deadline, but um, and and I believe in the legislative process. Uh, you know, let's make the bill better. I'm completely open um, to continuing to work with folks, but that's that that is the thing that it is lacking in current statute is the normal people feeling like they have a real choice or real power um, in the current setup. Mr. Chair, just a couple comments, please. So Representative Heinzman, and then I want to get to Representative Backer, and we will vote at uh, 10 to 10. Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, you know, what I'm hearing from the bill author is that no, uh, Representative Beckerman did not talk to the PUC. It sounds like there might have been some missed opportunities with phone calls and so on and so forth. but. It just seems to me that if we're going to write something that has such a significant effect in state statute, and it certainly overlaps with uh, what the PUC's job is, and uh, the folks, of course, being affected, pipeline operators, then it'd be good to have some feedback from, from them as to what may, uh, may be a positive or a negative. And it doesn't sound like those conversations happened. Uh, I'd, I'd hope that maybe if, if this language does continue to go forward, which I don't think that it will, but if it does, I do hope that those conversations do happen because it, it hasn't happened yet. At least that's what the testimony was today. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Backer. Yeah, thank you, um, um, Mr. Chair. I would have to agree with some of the things that's been said. We, we do need to get all the um, players involved, but I, I, I have to say I'm quite, I would agree with Representative Becker Finn. We do, in West Central Minnesota, it's been one of the greatest. I know it's not a pipeline issue, but West Central Minnesota, we want normal people to have control over their land because we have seen a overreach from several agencies with Bowser, DNR, MPCA. So um, I think we can find some common ground. There are concerns about this bill, and um, um, I agree with um, our lead on that there so with that said we're approaching the time to vote so i appreciate your time and we've uh, members we've had good testimony kind of on both sides of the issue and uh, the bill will be moving on and i think the author uh will be taking that into in, into account that's how the legislative process works uh so uh, uh representative becker finn uh, to close yep uh, thank you mr chair and i i just want to note you know there's no requirement that any of us uh, get sign off from pipeline operators or other agencies or, or really anyone. Um, certainly it can be helpful depending upon, uh, you know, <laughs> what, um, what your goals are with a specific bill uh, to, to have those conversations. And I will continue to have those conversations, but um, there's, there's really no need for us to have a sign off. We, we work for the people. I'm elected by the people of my district and I work for the people of Minnesota and the people of Minnesota uh, deserve to have some more power uh, when it comes comes to this issue. It's um, we absolutely should be making it clear where um, where the responsibility lies uh, when we stop using these old forms of infra infrastructure, because the future really isn't going to be this pipeline, the, be the pipelines. Uh, we, we know that the climate is changing and things will change and this will be an ongoing issue for our state. And I uh, appreciate the opportunity uh, to lift up this issue uh, in this moment, Mr. Chair. Uh, and with that, I would renew my motion uh, that House File 4360, as amended, uh, be referred to the Judiciary Committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. 
Representative Becker Finn renews her motion in House File 4360 as amended be recommended to be referred to judiciary. The clerk will take the roll. Chair Hansen. Aye. Hansen, aye. Vice Chair Wozlowick. Wozlowick, aye. Wozlowick, aye. Lead Heinzman. No. Heinzman, no. Representative Acom. Aye. Acom, aye. Representative Ackland. Ackland, no. Ackland, no. Representative Backer. Um, Backer, no. Backer, no. Representative Becker Finn. Aye. Becker Finn, aye. Representative Eklund. Representative Eklund. Representative Fisher. Fisher, aye. Fisher, aye. Representative Green. No. Green, no. Representative Igo. Igo, no. Igo, no. Representative Jordan. Jordan, aye. Jordan, aye. Representative Keeler. Keeler, aye. Keeler, aye. Representative Lee. Lee, aye. Lee, aye. Representative Lippert. Lippert, aye. Lippert, aye. Representative Lewick. Lewick, no. Lewick, no. Representative Morrison. Morrison, aye. Morrison, aye. Representative Nelson. Nelson, no. Nelson, no. Representative Tice. Tice, no. Tice, no. Checking one more time for Representative Ackland. Representative Eklund. All right, Mr. Chair, there are 10 ayes and eight nays. Mr. Chair, the motion, prevail, the motion prevails and the bill moves to judiciary. Next up, House File 3947, Vice Chair Wozniak, would you take uh, the gavel? Yes, I will. Representative Hansen, would you like to move your bill? Yes, Madam Chair, I will move that House File 3947 be laid over for possible inclusion in the omnibus bill. Representative Hansen, to your bill. And thank you, Madam Chair. I know we're tight on time, and I would note that uh, the bill is being laid over. Uh, members, uh, you know, kind of like the last bill, we spend a lot of time talking about permitting and allowing and getting things going. We've spent time for the last 10 years about improving processes for permitting. But what often is forgotten is disposal. What happens at the end? And for every beginning, there's an end. There's always an end to something. Things out uh, last for a while and then they end. And the bill here is about feedlots. And feedlot law uh, is complicated. Uh, much of the law was passed two or three decades ago. A great deal of activity in the early 90s and again in the late 90s. And feedlot abandonment is an issue. Let me say again, abandonment of feedlot pits is an issue. That can be a threat to our environment. Great deal of effort, great deal of work on getting things established, getting them created, getting them working. But how do we deal with abandonment? And with abandonment, there can be changes in property. There can be changes in property ownership. There can be changes in ownership of the livestock. There can be changes in the ownership of the buildings. We've also had an increase in size. So my concern with the bill is that we're putting a responsibility for financial assurance for new and renewing feedlot permits for those large animal units, over a thousand animal units. I don't want our state to be in a position where we're having facilities that are too big to fail. As we've gone through the COVID crisis, we saw what happened when livestock could not be moved to market. What if a feedlot fails? What if it's abandoned? Do the taxpayers then have the responsibility for picking up, cleaning up the pit? I don't want that to happen. So having that financial assurance responsibility in uh, item section one is there. Next is just like in the last bill, we're asking for an inventory. We're asking the agency and there's a complicated way of delegated authorities and not delegated counties for responsibility for regulation of feedlots. So though we want an inventory, that doesn't mean go back to the beginning of feedlots and see if there's still something there. That means looking for facilities that have abandoned pits 
that have manure in them. And then finally, we provide some money for the agency to make this happen. So it's a good prevention by looking for an inventory of the problem so we can start to address it, and then also preventing future problems by providing financial, financial assurance on new and renewing feedlot permits. I have several testifiers. First up, I have Aaron Clems. If you can introduce yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. I do wanna note before you begin, um, we do have some additional time, um, but we still wanna keep testimony relatively short. Mr. Clems. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Wasilek. Uh, thank you, Chair Hansen, for introducing HF 3947, a bill that would require financial assurance for large permitted animal operations in Minnesota. My name is Aaron Clems. I'm the Chief Strategy Officer at the Minnesota Center for Environmental Advocacy, a nonprofit organization with almost 50 years of experience using law and science to protect Minnesota's environment. Financial assurance is a tool under Minnesota laws and regulations that can protect taxpayers from being held responsible for, for foreseeable cleanup costs from an operation. Applying this tool to large feedlots in Minnesota with potentially significant cleanup costs is an idea that has been considered for a long time. In February 1999, the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency extensively analyzed financial assurance for feedlot operations in a document titled Feedlot Issues. In it, the MPCA described them a variety of approaches to the problem of abandoned manure facilities, including financial assurance. At that time, in 1999, the problem of feedlot cleanup was deemed not quite as urgent as one might suppose, that's in quotes, for two reasons. First, because many abandoned feedlots in 1999 were small. Second, because frequently the net economic value of abandoned facilities remains positive. The report then states, quote, there is a significant aggregate cost associated with the closure of defunct feedlots, however, and a risk associated with the newer, higher investment facilities that will eventually wear out and decay. Since then, the average size of feedlots in Minnesota has grown exponentially. According to the Environmental Working Group, who analyzed MPCA data on feedlots, since 1991, the number of large CAFOs, concentrated animal feeding operations in Minnesota, swelled from 468 operations to 1,497. Most of these are hog operations. The size of these permitted operations is important because the scale of operations corresponds to the amount of manure produced and kept on site, and then the scale of cleanup needed after closure. As for the second reason why this was not as urgent in 1999, since then, there has been a massive shift toward increasingly complex ownership structures for feedlots. The use of multiple limited liability corporations, or LLCs, can create a challenge to assign liability for cleanup. Segmenting operations into multiple LLCs can also be used to concentrate liabilities on one corporate owner, threatening the idea that there will be net positive economic value for an abandoned feedlot because there's not as much land value underlying it. Parent corporations may also not be the permittee, leaving the permittee with limited assets. So limited liability corporations and companies may also insulate owner assets and make it difficult for the public to recover the costs needed to clean up a, a, a feedlot. Financial assurance is utilized in HF 3947 is a tool that can prevent the use of complex ownership structures to avoid environmental cleanup costs, sometimes with multiple LLCs on, this, on the same site. The size of the needed financial assurance for a feedlot is not the same size as a landfill or copper nickel mines, which are two other examples of places in Minnesota statute and rules where we use financial assurance to protect Minnesota taxpayers. But abandoned feedlots, particularly if they have a poorly managed manure storage facility, can pose a threat to water quality, and having the resources available to the public needed to clean up those abandoned operations would be a good step and would ensure that the public is not stuck with the cost. Thank you for bringing this bill forward, Chair Hanson. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you for your testimony. Next up, we have Russ Hilbert. If you can introduce yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Hello, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Russ Hilbert. I am the County Feedlot Officer for Kandiwai County and the outgoing Legislative Committee Chair and recent past president of the Minnesota Association of County Feedlot Officers, or MACFO, which is an affiliate of the Association of Minnesota Counties. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to House File 3947. MACPO shares the author's interest in water quality and ensuring that feedlot closure requirements have been followed. We do have several questions or concerns about the inventory and reporting work in sections two and three of the, of the bill. The current language has broad parameters for which, for which feedlots and mineral storage areas should be listed. Also, regardless of the scope, we have concerns about our capacity to do this work 
under the timelines and costs included in the current proposal. The feedlot program focuses on active sites. Uh, county feedlot officers perform many functions, including registration, permitting, inspections, education and assistance, complaint follow-up, and closure of, of abandoned feedlots that are under current registration. Also, in many cases, county feedlot officers have other roles and responsibilities in addition to feedlot duties. MACPO has been advocating for increased funding for delegated counties to better meet current obligations of the program. County feedlot fund program funding has only decreased since its peak in 2003. And thank you to Representative Lippert for authoring that bill. MACFO is open to working with the author to gather more information on this issue and to ensure feedlots and mineral storage areas also meet requirements of closure at the time of closure. I thank you for allowing me to testify today and I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you for your testimony. Um, last up is Brian Martinson. If you want to introduce yourself for the record and then proceed with your testimony. Good morning, Madam Chair and committee members. I am Brian Martinson, Environment and Natural Resources Policy Analyst with the Association of Minnesota Counties. MACFO's comments offered by Mr. Hilbert uh, reflect AMC's position, but I want to offer one additional issue uh, for your attention. In the 37 counties of the state that do not have delegated authority over feedlots, there's no feedlot officer, and the state is responsible for enforcement of feedlot rules. Uh, the state and not the county in those cases would be better positioned to address the inventory requirements uh, of this proposal. AMC, along with MACFO, is willing to work with the author and other stakeholders and ideas uh, around closure compliance and abandoned sites. And thank you for the opportunity to testify. Um, Representative Hansen, did you wanna to respond to that or should I move yeah. on to questions? Uh, happy to, those are good comments from MACVO and the counties. I'm happy to work with them. Uh, as I mentioned, we need to clarify the delegated and the non-delegated counties. All right, we will move to member questions. I see Representative Becker Finn has her hand up. Yeah, I thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, Representative Hansen, for bringing this bill forward. I just wanted to uh, direct uh, members, if they haven't uh, read the article yet, um, there's a really good kind of rundown of uh, this bill and the situation uh, in uh, the Blue Stem Prairie blog, um, and also kind of calls out the the there are some inconsistencies in the one of the letters that was uh, presented uh, as written testimony, and it doesn't seem like it's quite in line with what the bill actually says. So I just kind of wanted to make sure that folks are aware of that and actually looking at the bill language um, and maybe take a look at that Blue Step Prairie blog article um, to get a sense for it. So just wanted to make sure that folks were aware of that. Thank you, Madam Chair. I see Representative Heinzman slash Lewick. You're up next. Um, uh, Mr. Uh, Madam Chair, a uh, question, maybe MPCA can uh, answer this. Um, do we keep track of uh, how many uh, feedlots uh, do uh, terminate their license or not renew it? Do we have uh, a feedlot inventory for the state, both current and, uh, and past? I guess that's, that would be a question for MPCA since that's their general jurisdiction. Yes, I do see someone from MPCA on, if they're available to answer that question. Yes, Madam Chair, this is Glenn Scuda, the uh, Watershed Division Director at the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. And so, yes, we, uh, we, we have a very good inventory of the permitted facilities in the state. Obviously, those are they're all permitted. We, we know all of those. Um, for the smaller facilities that do not require permits that are registered, that is done um, in combination with MACFO, with the counties that have the delegation in the 50 um, counties that have accepted delegation. And then um, we work in the 37 counties as the PCA um, on the non-delegated as well. So we, we have a good, you know, good uh, accounting of the facilities in the state in terms of the uh, facilities that would be considered abandoned as per the language of the bill. 
we have we do have data on that, but it's a little you know unclear if we have complete data on that. It's one of those things of counting something that do you have a full inventory or not? Um, and even with the bill gives a definition of abandoned at you know two years. Um, there are operations that cease work, uh, so to speak, or cease operation for potentially longer than that, but are, you know, due to market concerns or family concerns, whatever, that may still return to business even after a period of two years. So a little bit more complicated on the accounting of abandoned facilities, um, but we, we do have a pretty good sense of the, um, the facilities that are out there between ourselves and the county programs. Representative Lewis. Thank you, Madam Chair. A uh, follow up on that. Um, so, and we're particularly uh, talking about MPDS permits, a thousand animal units and more. So, when a uh, entity doesn't come in and renew uh, their uh, MPDS permit, and I believe, as I remember, that's a five year permit, uh, does MPCA uh, follow up? Uh, uh, you know, technically the last day of that permit, they still have to comply with all the manure stowage and management elements. Uh, I'm, I'm curious, do you have uh, some expired or, or terminated or abandoned feedlots, a uh, thousand animal units and more that are on your list that you consider uh, problematic that need to be cleaned up that you're aware of right now? Mr. Scott, I hope I'm saying your last name correctly. I missed your pronunciation earlier. Uh, Madam Chair, it's, it's Scuda, no problem. Scuda. Um, Madam Chair, Representative Lewick, uh, so yes, of course, still facilities go out of business periodically um, and their permits, they do, there are uh, closure requirements uh, in the rules. Uh, so we do follow up on those to make sure that closure requirements are, are met. Um, it's not something that we have seen problems with in the past or currently. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Madam Chair, that, I can, that as the author. Chair, uh, Representative Hanson. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, Representative Lewick, I think you're misreading the bill. That's not just about those over 1,000 animal units. The financial responsibility is for those over 5,000 animal units. The issue is de facto closure, and that includes the small ones as well. So something can be abandoned, still be on the list. And that's what I'm talking about, those smaller ones. So the financial responsibility is for the bigger ones, but looking at the inventory so we get a better handle on those that are abandoned. Uh, if I could, Madam Chair. Representative Lewick, if you have one more, we got to get to represent back. Uh, thank you. And, and this goes back to the M MPCA. So uh, for those that uh, have something less than an MPDS permit, uh, and I'm one of those uh, uh, small feed lot, if you will. Uh, so am I exempt from all the manure management rules uh, that go along with any type of feed lot uh, simply because I decided to move my cattle out and I'm not operating anymore uh, as a small, can I just, ignore those or am I in violation uh, of uh, current regulations if I don't properly handle the manure that may be there? Mr. Scuda. Um, Madam Chair, Representative Lewick, um, there are different requirements for the permanent facilities than for the smaller uh, facilities, but there are still man manure management requirements for the smaller registered facilities, of course. Um, I don't have the particular provisions in front of me right now. Uh, we can certainly provide the, the requirements on manure management as a follow-up. Uh, Madam Chair, yeah, uh, well, well, thank you. I can, I can speak from personal experience. I know, uh, you know, uh, when you operate one of these, uh, uh, I can't just abandon manure. I've got to uh, take care of that, uh, very specific. I got some minimum maximum storage requirements where that manure has to be applied and how it's applied. So I, I would just uh, not sure we're, uh, we're really focusing on a, on a real existing problem here with that. Uh, that's all I've got, Madam Chair. Thank you. Madam all Chair. right. And we, we Representative Hanson. Um, Representative Lewick, I'm not talking about you being active, uh, yeah. but something could happen if you pass away or become incapacitated. 
or change of property. That's what we're talking about with abandonment. Things happen. I renew my motion that the house file be laid over for possible inclusion. We will talk about it more. We have a few other member questions, Representative Hansen. Um, we'll take those and then we'll move to closing remarks. Um, we are going to take a vote on this. Uh, we are going to wrap up, but uh, we have to wrap up by 10:15. So, Representative Backer. Yeah, thank, thank you, um, oh, Madam Chair. The only thing that I'm concerned about is um, about this is currently what I understand with MPCA, if a feedlot is um, abandoned or not abandoned, shut down, we already have procedures in place um, for that. And so, to me. <laughs> It's unclear what this bill really tries to do for that reason. So, cause right now, number one, you know, they have to remove the equipment from the land that's already out there through MPC. Number two, they also have to reduce anything, um, the nitrates by growing alfalfa grasses. And at the end of the day, small or large farms, they actually, um, they're good stewards of their land. At least we have never seen a problem out on the western part of Minnesota. So I, I'm kind of unclear what this actually solves um, and, and so forth. So that's my comment. Thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Nelson, you are the last question today. All right, uh, thank you for that. And uh, Madam Chair, and I was wondering what, uh, maybe a question for the MPCA, what size of a farm would be considered a feedlot with with animal, uh, how many animal units are needed to be considered a feed? Mr. Scudo? Um, Madam Chair, the question cut out for me at the end. Could it be repeated, please? Yep, Representative Nelson, can you repeat your question? Yes. Yes, uh, Madam Chair and uh, Mr. Scuda. I'm wondering how many animal units does it take for a farm to be called, considered a, being a feedlot? Mr. Scuda. Uh, Madam Chair, Representative. Um, so really at any size uh, of animal units that it is a feedlot, it, but in terms of permitting and, and registration, that's where sizes come into um, particular consideration. So for registration uh, at the lowest level, basically 10 uh, animal units in shoreland or 50 outside of shoreland is kind of the minimum level. And then typically permitted facilities are a thousand animal units or, or more. Representative Nelson, did you have a quick follow-up? Yeah, no, thank you for that. And I, I mean, so we're, you know, we're, we're labeling things as feedlots that, uh, you know, I it's probably accurate, but uh, I mean, this is going to be taking on some very small farms as well. Uh, some people that probably don't even believe that they would be in the category of being a feedlot and I uh, really put some onerous uh, regulations on them. And then I, I find it ironic that uh, to reduce the nitrates in the level, once one is closed, we plant alfalfa in there, which is a legume, which captures nitrogen and puts it in the soil. So I just find that uh, rather ironic that that's what we're doing, but uh, no, thank you for that. And, uh, this bill needs a lot of work and I think it's uh, something that's really a solution looking for a problem. And uh, it's, uh, that's my comments, thanks. Representative Heintzman. Thank you, Madam Chair, just a quick comment. And, and uh, Representative Hanson, I know you know this, uh, this is something clearly that needs to go to the Ag Committee. I know it's being laid over. I noticed it also doesn't have an, a Senate author, but either way, it does appear there needs to be a few more eyes on this. I don't think that uh, uh, Republicans and, and Democrats are that far off in our approach to wanting to make sure that there are rules in place and that these things are being and, uh, carefully uh, cataloged and, and considered. The, the issue is, is uh, in the middle somewhere, I think, and you know, if, if there is a serious effort going forward uh, on this bill, I hope that uh, the Aid Committee does get a chance to take a peek. And uh, of course, our friends on the other, in the other body, which we uh, probably mentioned too often. I apologize, uh, Representative Hansen, but at the same time, it, it kind of matters as to what the future might be for the language. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Hansen, closing remarks. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, members should note that the 
feedlot rules and law are in the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, which has been in the jurisdiction of this committee for probably 30 years or more. So uh, these are provisions that, go, that are perfectly heard in this committee. Secondly, I would encourage members to read the bill and maybe we need a primer on existing law. So what we're talking about here are facilities that already are in the system, not bringing anybody new and a checking to see if they're abandoned. So 10 animal units right next to a river or a creek could have an impact on water quality. That's why they're in existing law and rules. 50 animal units can have an impact on improper disposal. So we're talking about abandonment. I would renew my motion that this be uh, laid over for possible. Representative Hansen renews his motion that House File 3947 be laid over for possible inclusion in an omnibus bill. The bill is laid over and with no further business before the committee, we are adjourned. Mm -hmm.